And, all right. Well, welcome, everybody. Good to have you with us this evening. We're getting ready to get started in our class. We're in 2 Samuel chapter 22. I call it the epilogue for this book of 2 Samuel. Um, so we'll see you get people kind of sit in. I do have my chat up so I can read it. Read it. Um, I see uh, Chelsea. She said, sorry, can't make it. Yeah. Started a little late. Well, and I know what she means, so that that's completely understandable. Thank you for letting me know. Um, looks like we lost it. Did we lose our chat? Yes, I'm working on it. So, yeah, let me know. Tonight, I really want to get you guys involved online because we are going to look in 2 Samuel chapter 22. It's the song of deliverance that David wrote. Remember the epilogue? It's not chronological. It's, it's just some very important key stories, kind of not really hodgepodge, but they are. They're not really necessarily connected with each other. Last week, we looked at the Philistines. We looked at, um, there we go, we got it back. Dorothy, good. Oh, good, 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 guys. I'm glad. Yeah, I really do. I want, as I go through the class, I want you to, I know you got your Bibles or you got something where you can look. And because we're going to go through David's Song of Deliverance, and I'm going to go through it and kind of have some discussion with it as we go. And so look for some verses or things that you see in reference to the, the verses that we're going to be dealing with. Um, it's not all brand new. Aileen, glad you made it. Well, I hope everybody's bundling up. It looks like snow outside, man. We are definitely, this, it's a no joke. Fact check, true. It's going to snow. <laughs> it's going to snow, and it's going to get cold. It's sleeting right now over here at the church building. So, And I know up in the mountains, I walked out a while ago and looked up there, and it, you, you could definitely see the clouds are building up there. And Texas, you guys might really be getting some hard freeze tonight. Kind of warmed up my chickens. Don't want to lose them my chickens. So... But I, I am. I'm excited about getting started with this and looking at this song of deliverance. It's going to be a little different in the way I'm looking at it. I, I'm not a scholar of Hebrew poetry. I'm going to tell you, I'm not. Um, I know and understand some of it and kind of the format in which they structure it. Even when I was in college and in English class, we started doing some poetry and structure and the different styles, and I just fell asleep. I, I just, I don't know, ADD, but I just never have been able to, but don't get me wrong, I, I love it. I love poetry. I love, you know, songs, and I use them, if you notice. Um, and, and then if we take a look at the Hebrew Psalms, out of the book of Psalms, those are songs. And so this one that we're going to look at tonight, it is also, there's several sections of it, so it's not going to sound completely brand new to you. It's interesting that it's included at the end of 2 Samuel, at the end of David's life, which is interesting because he could have said, well, you know, we'll just put it with all the other Psalms that David wrote. So that's another question I want you to think about is, why would the writer of Samuel put a Psalm in here? Because that basically what he did is he took a Psalm and he put it in this book about the life of David. So let's think about that too, and we get to the end of the class. Um, we'll kind of discuss that, and if I don't bring it up, because I, it is interesting. Because remember, this is an epilogue, so we're having some important stories that the writer's trying to bring to us as he wraps up his book about the life of David. So this psalm being in here has a link. Um, but this is a song of deliverance, and... I, I thought about this um, lady, Michella or Michaela, I've heard it both ways, Flores. She's a survivor of the shooting in Las Vegas, Nevada, a few years back. Remember that? I mean, and a week and a half after the shooting in Las Vegas, she was being interviewed, and she said, last Sunday morning I was running from bullets. This Sunday morning I was running from fire. Her house burned down. So she goes from 
being at this really uplifting concert, having fun, I'm sure, with friends, to terror. I mean, it was an extenuated terror. I mean, it just, because it, this guy, if you remember, kept shooting and shooting and shooting, and they could not find him, and then he just kept, people around you are getting hit and falling around, and the mob is just scattering thousands of people. And so she survives that, and, that's, and then she goes home, and the next Sunday, her house burns down. So we had those times. Because this is kind of David's life. You know, there's a part of this that I think kind of relates. I know personally, um, 1981 was not a good year. It was a terrible year for me. In September 2nd, my father was killed in a truck wreck. Then in October, I found out that my last grandparent, uh, my grandmother, had cancer, which was my father's mom. And she had just a few weeks to live or so, maybe. And then in January, my little brother was run over by a gooseneck horse trailer, broke both legs, they had to transport him and fly him, medevac him up to Albuquerque. It was extremely touch and go whether he was going to live. So I was driving up there, coming back, um, trying to go to school still. Um, and then that same week, my grandmother dies. So I'm going to a funeral, and then I turn around and leave the funeral for my grandmother and then take off and go to Albuquerque to see my little brother on a ventilator with both his legs broke and all these tubes coming out of him, collapsed lungs, and, and it just seemed to not want to stop. It just seemed to just keep coming out. Um, I was a Christian, and I did not do well. I did not. Um, I turned in all the wrong directions, and I think that if I had been wise enough that I am now today, that I think that looking at this psalm would have helped me a lot. Um, and I was a lukewarm Christian at best. I was 20 years old, and you know, I, I thought I had the world by the tail, and it just kept coming at me. And I know, I, it, my story, I'm not saying to um, make you have for me because I know that everybody that I've met have stories as horrific if not maybe worse than than that and it it just like it never lets up sometimes and so with that I want you to go to that moment in your life where you were so overwhelmed that there really you didn't know what to do and it's very challenging in our faith and so that's what David, he experienced. If you look at the younger years, and that's really when this, this song is written. Uh, in, it's probably, it's estimated maybe right after Saul died and he had become king and maybe just started to rule in Jerusalem. So his enemies, because he had a couple attacks, remember incursions by the Philistines, they came in. Um, so... They came in and attacked, and so there, there's a point where he still didn't have the rest. He had to reunite the tribes. Remember, seven and a half years of all this just kept coming at him, kept coming at him. So I want us to look at these and listen to these words and the references, the repetitiveness, too. There's a rhythm here. Um, I'm going to try to capture that. I'm not going to read through the whole psalm. I'm gonna, we're going to take it by a couple of sections as we go through but there is a rhythm. There's references that repeat um, that you'll see. Fortress, rock, um, refuge, things like this that are going on. What? Deliverer, descriptors that continue to come back. There's also this flow of <clears throat> always, <clears throat> and this is true with all the Psalms, where they present the problem or they glorify God and then present the problem and then kind of go back and forth between it. And this is what we see with David in this psalm is stating what's going on, reminding of the fact that who God is, coming back to remembering maybe a part of problems that he's dealing with, and then showing again how great God is, what God has done for him. Chelsea says it reminds me of Job. The pain wouldn't stop for him, it seemed. I agree. Yeah, I think that's a very good application. Job was one as well that it just seemed like it would never stop. Um, 
And that's a great lesson as well, isn't it? So where do we turn? And I think that this psalm, as we go through it, I think it'll help us to take a look at it. So <clears throat> let's go ahead and start. Verse 1 alone starts out and just establishes it. This is what he says in verse 1. <clears throat> and David spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. We kind of have a timeline, right? We kind of have a timeline, and that's why I said, from when was he finally delivered from Saul? Well, when Saul was killed, he still had seven years of enemies, of reconciliation, some civil war going on. Um, then he had the Philistines incur into the country, trying to get him. So that's why I think maybe after that second uh, battle with the Philistines, right after he established the city of Jerusalem, is when, when he finally was able to catch a breath spiritually. Um, and maybe, you know, another point would be a great time was when he moved the tabernacle back to, moved it to Jerusalem. It was a very spiritual moment. It was a, a time of reflection. A lot of times when it's in the moment of it, it's difficult for us to stop and to reflect on it. So this is a psalm that it's after after we've gone through something and we look and we witness and what God has accomplished for us, be able to, to then give him this joy. So this is what it says he spoke. Um, <clears throat> so verses 2 and 4. <clears throat> he said, the, rock is <clears throat> the Lord is my rock and the fortress and my deliverer. <clears throat> Hold on a second, I got it. <clears throat> Try it again. He said, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield, and the horn of salvation, my stronghold, and my refuge, my Savior. You saved me from violence. I called upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. So look at the way he, this repetitiveness, this tying into the idea of the rock, of the one place that was constantly unchanging. There's, if you compare to natural elements and such, you know, their rocks are the most stable, you know, um, strength-wise and such. So that's what he's trying to show us, and that he's not only just a rock, but he's also a fortress. It is. It's a way, you're right. It's a way of him saying, you know, giving honor, glory, and praise, um, and, and yet it's tailored. I see it kind of tailored towards um, the deliverance. But these are attributes that are very clearly what he is focusing on about God is that he's a rock, he's a fortress, he's one who has delivered me, and... That's where he took refuge. Now that's, that's kind of a little important there, isn't it? I mean, you know, you could have a fortress, but you got to go there. <laughs> you got to seek it. And so there are times, isn't there, where we, we know God is a rock, we know God is a fortress, but do we seek the refuge? Do we try to go to the fortress? Like what he says, he went there. He goes, I, I went there, and he's also this shield, kind of the same idea of a fortress, but more personal. You know, the fortress is something that is a more of a larger location in which you can go, but a shield is a personal item of protection that you can use. And so then the horn of my salvation, that's an interesting one we'll, we'll look at. That's a, that is talking about strength. And, he's, and again, he just repeats the concept of stronghold, my refuge, and the fact that he saved him, but what did he save him from? He saved him from violence. I mean, look at the times, all the times that David was in peril, from Goliath to the time that Saul was throwing spears at him, and the times that he was pursuing him and trying to catch him, all the things that David went through, and he recognizes that. 
So that's, that's what I think is important for us as Christians, is that we need to stop, and even if it's tonight for a moment, and look upon your life and recognize the things that God has saved you from. Can you see them? We need to start looking and being more in tune with what's happening around us and what God is doing for us. Because I know that, you know, it sounds like a broken record, but I keep saying this, but it's, it's like we live our faith in the rearview mirror. We look in the rearview mirror and we can see, oh, how wonderful God has all done for us. But what about forward? What, what, what about as we're living our lives and we're engaging things that we're able to see God working? But there is a time to, we do need to look at the clarity of behind us and then acknowledge, like David did, that he said, and he prayed, says, you know, I called. That's a prayer. I called on him. And, and he deserves, that's what Becky just said, you know, he, he deserves the praise, doesn't he? And he said, I am saved from my enemies. Do we dare to pray that and expect the same that David had as a Christian? We should, shouldn't we? I mean, I, I, I think that we're timid. We're too, I think too many Christians, we're timid about it. Like, well, that's David. He was an anointed one, and he was very special, so he had this kind of very special relationship. And so, yes, he could call on the Lord, and, and the Lord was going to save him from his enemies and such. No, he, he's not any special, any more special than you and I are to the Lord. And that's what's, I think, challenging to us spiritually to not become discouraged because we look at David and him, and if, you have, if, if there's one thing you've got out of this class so far, David was really messed up. He had some terrible things he did. He did. I mean, premeditated murder, adultery, and we're going to get to another one in the next, uh, next week, some things that David did that just blows your mind to think. And, and there's actually a passage here, some scripture we're going to get to, that when I read it, I, th- I went, hmm, could you really say that, David? Because I know you, David. I, read, I just read about you, and now when I read this psalm, I wonder. And so that makes him real to all of us. So he said he's worthy. And that's where Psalms 31.3, we see where this has been used again and again. And this is also a psalm of David. But I like this one because it says, Since you are my rock and my fortress, for the sake of your name, guide me. See, there's, there's a key. I think that right there is something very important to us, is that, like he says in this verse in Psalm 31, is since you are, you're that rock, you're that fortress, you're that shield, then for the sake of your name, for the purpose of you, Lord, guide me. And we need to submit ourselves in that like he does. Now, the phrase that we read about the horn of salvation, you know, there's a lot of times we read terms that are very culturally isolated from us, and this is one. Um, so what is a horn? Where is it? I'm going to, Chelsea brought something up. I'm going to go over there to Isaiah 12. Yeah, she said it's similar to Isaiah 12, and it's, it's, a, it's four verses. You will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for though you were angry with me, you, your anger turned away, that you might comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust, and I will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say in that day, Give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, Proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitants of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. 
They're not isolated, are they? These are not isolated passages when we look at this. It's what's, what I think is so amazing. Every one of these thoughts continually are, are coming at us as we absorb, we become absorbed in the Bible, and the Bible absorbed into us. That We see this constantly reminder, just like within the individual Psalms, these concepts are brought up and brought up and brought up and brought up, like the rock, the rock, the rock. And then we see the same thing, like just going over to Isaiah. We can go to Job and we can find those same things. It should help keep reinforcing the, these, these thoughts that uh, David here in this psalm is even trying to help us remember as well. And so um, the, the, the horn in Zacharias, when he was, um, remember, John the Baptist's father, whenever he heard that he was going to have a baby, remember what happened? He didn't believe, and he lost his voice. And it wasn't until later on when they were naming him, and Elizabeth goes, we're going to name him John. Everybody's like, John's not in your family. There's no Johns. And so that's when Zacharias wrote that his name shall be John. And then he gained his voice back, and then he prophesies. And this is in, this is a, the verse out of that prophecy, he refers this to John the Baptist as this idea. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. And that's what, David, that's what John the Baptist was, was he was a rock that started hammering away from all the, the falsehoods and shattering all the, the hypocrisy and paving that way, as the prophet Malachi said, in preparing the way for the Messiah. So I found that. So let's go on and look at verses 5 through 7 now. <clears throat> For the waves of death encompass me, the torrents of destruction assail me, the cords of Sheol entangle me, the snares of death confronted me. In my distress I called upon the Lord. To my God I called. From his temple he heard my voice, and my cry came to his ears. This is so descriptive, isn't it? When we look at the idea of these wave after wave, you know, and the way that it's describing it coming upon us, um, it, it's just overwhelming, isn't it? I mean, that's what happens. You know, it's like a wave. And he describes its wave of death, and it just comes all around. It overwhelms. So he uses waves, torrents. Um, then he uses cords, entanglement, and it's it death, <laughs> destruction, uh, Sheol, which is the grave, death. I mean, all of that idea around how how much he felt that he was going to die, and he came so close, and it was so overwhelming to him. Cords, you get tangled up in them, you know, ensnaring in that, and he was just, I think that he did have that. This does express a genuineness of his heart where, you know, he was still a person, and when things were going bad, you know, that this is what he truly felt. But what did he do in his time of distress? He said, I called. So he, I, in my distress, so during those times, what was made him successful? What helped him? I called to the Lord. I cried. I called out. And what I love is that last part of seven. Where's God? So from his temple, he heard my voice. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? Isn't that wonderful to think? That here you are, just little old you, you know, insignificant not really that powerful or anything. And yet, the Lord from his temple hears us. And his cry, and my cry came to his ears. Let's not forget that the Lord is in tune with us, that he knows what's happening to us. It's easy to forget that and become very discouraged. And start to feel exactly what he says in five, these waves of death and all of this encompassing and the torrents of destruction assailing upon us. But 
Remember, when you cry out, the Lord, He hears you from heaven, from His temple. Let's go to 8. Then the earth reeled and rocked. The foundations of the heavens trembled and quaked because He was angry. Smoke went up from His nostrils and devouring fire from His mouth. Glowing coals flamed forth from Him. He bowed the heavens and came down. Thick darkness was under his feet. He rode on a cherub and flew. He was seen on the wings of the wind. He made darkness all around his canopy. Thick clouds, a gathering of water. Out of the brightness before his coals of fire flamed forth. The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice. And he sent out arrows and scattered them lightning, and routed them. Then the channels of the sea were seen. The foundations of the world were laid bare. At the rebuke of the Lord, the blast of his breath of his nostrils. So this part is, what did we just, we ended with? We ended with the idea of where he was at. He was, the Lord heard him from his temple. And then this is what the Lord did. This is what the Lord took action on. And I don't know that you can get a more powerful picture. So did David even really hear this? Did he see him? Um, Chelsea says, David hit rock bottom and refound God. Sounds like we can all relate. Absolutely. You know, and you don't have to hit rock bottom to get overwhelmed. Well, I guess that, that is rock bottom. You know, when we become so overwhelmed, we get to that point, right, where we're, we feel lost. Um, I think his persistence and the fact that as he was in those distressful moments, that he would cry out to the Lord, and this is what would happen. The Lord, I, I, just, I just think this... Some of the, the language is so amazing when it talks about in describing the power of God. The earth reeled and rocked. <laughs> you know, the foundations of the heavens trembled and quaked because God was angry. You think, you know, you always wonder when somebody gets angry, how do they act? You know, some people, very controlled. Some people, when they're angry, you know, they lose control. This is controlled anger, by the way. You know, we know it's a righteous anger. Um, but this is provoked. This is something that I see with David crying out to the Lord that he has brought that message and that emotion to God, and God hearing him has provoked God into action, brought him out to come forward. And so that's this powerful image, glowing coals flame forth from him. Bends the heavens, he comes down thick. I mean, this is an amazing, I mean, I, I can't even grasp a lot of the aspects of this, but I do get some of the powerful images individually. And we try to bring those all together and coming with an angel and the wings of the wind um, and out of the brightness before him, the coals of flame, a fire flame forth. The Lord thundered from heaven. Most High uttered his voice. He sent out arrows and scattered them. I think that we have to understand that even though his power is working in ways that we don't see it, we don't necessarily see, or we don't have an earthquake every time the Lord answers our prayers. I, I've never had one, you know, where he's delivered me from his enemy, and I saw all these visual things happening. But I think what David is trying to express is that he is active. He is involved, right? Yeah, Becky says he's using all the creation. And, that, and, and you know, that's something that we have seen. If you think about everything he's described, except a cherub or somebody flying on the wind, but everything, arrows, you know, seeing them fly, lightning, earthquakes, 
some of the most frightening things you could ever be a part of or be in. Um, and then look at 16. This is what I thought was interesting. The channels of the sea. The channels of the sea are exposed. These are ocean currents. Did you know that man did not know that there were currents in the ocean when this was written? It wasn't until, I think, some French scientists in like the 7th, I don't know, maybe the 15th, 16th century, that he actually had read this passage in others in Psalms that talks about the current in the water or the channels of the deep and realized, I bet you there, and there are like rivers larger than the Mississippi that flow through the oceans. And you can, submariners talk about them where, you know, they will be going along and they'll use them because they'll, they'll jump into it and it'll just take them, you know, speed wise. It also, they use it for hiding because it changes the acoustics and stuff. But I just, this is amazing. He's exposed it. He's brought it forward. The channels of the sea were seen. Can you see them? I, I can't. I mean, I could probably look up on Google and probably get an image today. But really, the point is, something that is never seen has now been brought forward to where it was able to be seen. And... He exposes, he rips open and brings forward, and it's at the rebuke of the Lord. So this is the response. This is the answering of David's prayer. And then this comes back to what God has done, and the result of this amazing imagery of God's response coming forward, and then David continues. <clears throat> He sent from on high. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He rescued me from my strong enemy, from those who hate, hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. So, what did the Lord do? The Lord responded. The Lord answered his prayer. Did the Lord actually come down and pick up David and then take him up on top of a mount, you know, and set him there and say, okay, sit here? The, the, again, it's figurative, but it's real. And that on high is a position of honor. It's a position of power, mountains. That's what he's referring to. God took him from a lowly place and brought him into a very powerful position. And then, so he drew him out of the many waters that were overrunning him, rescued him from his enemies, and he said, who hated me? They, it's not just regular people who don't like me, they're not my friend. These are people who are hating him. And they were too much for him. He was not going to be able to prevail against them. If you think about the army, that he, of the little band of brothers that he had running around with him, you know, there were at 1.600 against King Saul's army of close to ten to 15,000. Hmm. There were way too many for him. If the, he could never have gone one-on-one -on -one and fought his army against theirs directly. And so I think that's a reference to that as well. And, then, and of course, you know, what do your enemies do? <laughs> they hit you when you're down. That's exactly when they do. They don't, they don't fight fair. They're going to fight dirty. And so that's what he says. They got me when I was at my worst, when everything was overwhelming me. But he did not forget, the Lord was his support. And I want you to remember this, okay? That as we call upon the Lord, that he's listening to us from his temple, that we may not see the exact type of things that he's describing figuratively with the lightning and stuff, but please understand, 
it provokes God because he cares for his children. And the same thing is just as applicable for us today. And looking around, understanding that he is rescuing us, he is time and time again, he's rescuing us. And even during the times when we think that it's all over, there's no way we can win. He says, you'll win. Why? I think this is beautiful. Look at that last, those last two words. The Lord delighted in David. Why did the Lord delight in David? Remember, this is the guy who premeditated murdered a husband in order to cover up adultery, um, all the chaos in his house, all the things, you know. So he didn't delight in him because he was sinless. As God will state later, David was a man after my heart. And if you really think about the people in your life, it's not about them being perfect, but it's about how much they respect and love you, truly love you. Covers up a lot of faults, doesn't it? When you really focus on the fact that you love them, and that's what David had for God, even though he would commit some terrible sins, he never lost his love for God. And like in that encounter when Nathan the prophet came to him and was going to strike him down, David instantly was able to snap back. It's never too late as well, but the idea that he, I love the way he rescued me because he delights in me. He will rescue you because he delights in you as his child. Chelsea says, perhaps he knew that he was a sinner and admitted he needed God for his help and guidance until the people that doubled down and refused to see they need help. Not sure about the last part, but it, yes. I, I think that's exactly what he sees is... Um, his failures in his sin, um, unlike, yeah, okay, there we go. Yeah, she's saying, unlike people who double down and they'll just stay stubborn away from God. Um, I, I just think this is wonderful to, under, to look at the deliverance and that we, we need to see this in our lives. That's what I want us to do. I think that's what is so important to this message as well. So let's continue on, 21 through 25. The Lord dealt with me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands, and rewarded me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord, and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his rules were before me, and from his statutes I did not turn aside. I was blameless before him, and I have kept myself from guilt. And the Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his sight. That's the part. Huh? Did it get you a little bit? It got me. Now, kind of give some latitude here. You know, when was this written? You know, um, it wasn't until after his enemies had been delivered, and then he's sitting around. This psalm could have already been written. And then the transgression with Bathsheba. But we know that no one is perfect. Even if he didn't do the blatant sins that are recorded, we know that he's a sinner. Paul said all men have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's exactly why that in the Mosaic Law, that the animal sacrifices were still there. David was not an exception. David had to have you know, a sacrifice for him as well. So it's, it's, but you read this. Look at the boldness. The Lord dealt with me according to my righteousness. The Lord deals with you and me according to our righteousness. Now, what does that mean? To 
Sounds arrogant. Sounds arrogant, right? I mean, you know, well, my righteousness, you know, we always hear about self-righteousness, but what? There's something so important in this. He dealt according to my righteousness. His righteousness, how, so let's, let's simplify the word. His rightness before God. His correctness, not perfection. So his following his law, Mosaic law, and, and also, you know, even when he would sin, he still had the same process under Mosaic law and being able to maintain a relationship with him. So he maintained a right relationship with him by following Mosaic law, whatever the transgression may have been, then the sacrifice, the atonement, whatever process was necessary, then that's what was done. That's what he would do. That brought him into a righteousness. Now, if he stopped, like he did with Bathsheba, oh, okay, no, because he didn't repent. Once he repented, right there in front of Nathaniel, he became righteous, right with God again. So how are we righteous? Well. John says in 1 John 1, starting in, um, let's go down to 6. Just, he says, if we have fellowship with him and we walk in the darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And he's inferring the idea of being baptized and being our, having our sins forgiven in a new covenant relationship. So, if we're with God, we're in light. We cannot be both. And so we have to be careful in that. But that's how we have fellowship, fellowship spiritually with God. But he says, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrightness. Right there unrighteousness. So uh, out of God's correctness, he, it fixes it. It brings us back to where we have that same correct. We can say, and we should say, that it, we are righteous. Sounds arrogant, but it's not. It means we're right. We're righteous with God. And I don't want to shy away from that. That's what David, why he can say it with such confidence here in 2 Samuel 22. And that comes from having our sins forgiven through baptism, putting us into the body of Christ. So that's what I think is so neat about that, is that. Um, so. Well, and when we don't, we have to confess them. Confess those sins, brings us back, makes us righteous again. 
When we fail again, we have to confess them. You know, I mean, it's when we stop. We stop trying to follow those statutes, and we stop trying to follow what he is, yes. And then that puts us, separates us away from it. I'm sorry about your internet. I'm not sure uh, about the buffeting on YouTube. Chelsea, I'm not sure. I'd have to wait and look at the video afterwards. It was us. VMix completely froze, but it's back. You didn't have to, did you have to restart it? No. It just kind of froze? Mm-hmm. Okay, it was on our side. <laughs> but we're back. Um, so, after he talked about this righteousness, and flowing to the next verse in 26, with mercy, with the merciful, you show yourself merciful. With the blameless man, you show yourself blameless. With the purify, you deal purely. And with the crooked, you make yourself torturous. You save the humble people, but your eyes are on the haughty to bring them down. For you are my lamp, O Lord, and my God light lightens my darkness. So this, this flows again with what he had just said about the righteousness and that relationship he has and how God has dealt with him. What is mercy? Well, part of grace. It's part of a favor. It's a part of showing us and relenting and allowing us to have the ability to be forgiven and be in a right relationship. It's the ability today as Christians to be able to go to him and confess our sins to him. He's merciful in providing that sacrifice of his son, and that is because of grace, his favor that he has demonstrated to us. So the same, again, is, is for us, and this is how God deals. Merciful to those who are what? Who show yourself merciful. Hmm, sound like a teaching of Jesus, a Sermon on the Mount, some other teachings, you know. Um, so, if, well, it makes sense. It's the same God. You know, there's nothing brand new in the New Testament, so it's the same type of a concept that we always have. But this is, this is the essence of God. God is merciful to those who are merciful. You know, and so, but the other side of this is to the crooked, <laughs> torturous. We don't understand what shrewd means, though. See, that's where some of those words, torturous, I get it. You torture someone, you're like haunting them. Shrewdness is conniving a little, or, you know, the same manipulative, I guess. So saying... So with the crooked, God makes himself more shrewd. That's kind of what he's saying. The crooked are so the New King James saying crooked is deviant. That's Yeah, and with the devious. Yeah, see, the Greek says crooked. Um, 640, distorted, hence false, crooked, forward, perverse. So that's the person, and that's why I think ESV, that's, that's, I, that fits. And then um, shrewd, let's see. Primitive root to twine, to struggle or be torturous. Forward, shrewd, un, shrewd self, unsavory, wrestle. God does. I wonder what the...
So, let's see. Okay. Yeah, it looks like we are glicking. I wonder if uh, it must. I wonder it might be the weather. We're having having a little bit of glitches or something. So, um, for by you I can run against a troop, and by my God I can leap over a wall. This God, His way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in Him. For who is God, but the Lord? And who is a rock? except our God. This God is my strong refuge and has made my way blameless. Again, same type of thing, see? We still see this idea of what God is doing. Uh, The perfection, the the strength that we draw from him, um, the refuge, a place in which we can go and be. Um, I like the idea that he can go against numerous... uh, he can go against a troop, which is basically saying I can go against an outnumbered group of people. I can scale a wall. I can do these things and accomplish them. Um, yeah, I'm over on the King James. Also, and flipping back and forth, looking to see those. Bottom line, his way is perfect, and the Lord's proven. So when he says the word, okay. And I like the way he says, who's God? (laughs) Except the Lord, which is Jehovah. You know, it's another form of, in the Greek, it has a different essence, the existence of one, the proper name of the one true one, unpronounced except with a vowel of pointings of. So it's a variant of Jehovah, existing one. So who is God? The existing one. It's like whenever, similar to the way Moses was told, he said, well, who do I say is sending me? He says, tell him I am. Is sending me. So 34, he made my feet like feet of deer, and he set me secure on heights. He trains my hands for war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. You have given me the shield of your salvation, and the gentleness, your gentleness made me great. That's an interesting, and he says, you know the way he says that, your gentleness That, that, to me, is just interesting. How does God's gentleness make you great? That's kind of a neat thought in 36. And here's a shield again. See? Salvation, saving, it's more personal than just a fortress. So 37 and 40. You gave me a wide place for my steps under me, and my feet did not slip. I pursued my enemies and destroyed them. They did not turn back until they were consumed. I consumed them. I, tr- I thrust them through so that they did not rise. They fell under my feet, for you equipped me with strength for the battle. You made those who rise against me sh- sink under me. So with God on his side, God answering his prayer, God delivering him to a position of power, being his shield for salvation, he's able to then accomplish overtaking those enemies that were so much more powerful than him, who were taking advantage of him during his calamity, and all those things. God's turned him around and created within him one who could decisively destroy his enemies. And then he goes on about his enemies. He says, you made my enemies turn their backs to me, those who hated me, and I destroyed them. They looked, but there was none to be saved. They cried to the Lord, but he did not answer them. I beat them as fine as dust of the earth. I crushed them. I stampled them down like the mire of the streets. I like the idea that, you know, sometimes people who think they're Christians, right, that are actually enemies of others, they turn and cry when it turns against them. They turn to God 
That's frightening too. You know, that, that's kind of frightening too as a Christian to think, I hope I'm not that Christian that, you know, I'm actually the one, and when I cry out to the Lord, that I'm the one that's wrong. I think it's humbling to think that, you know, here you are pursuing somebody you believe is wrong with God, but it's actually you. Uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul, right? Now, he doesn't, it's not that he physically did not hear him. It had to do with response. God did not respond to them. And pretty, dis, pretty um, decisive destruction, destruction, isn't it? So 44, he delivered me from my strife. So not only did he deliver me from his enemies, but look, now it's my, the strife. You delivered me from strife with my people. Remember that civil war? Seven years? You kept me as the head of the nations. People whom I have not known served me. Foreigners came cl- cringing to me. As soon as I heard, they heard of me, they obeyed me. Foreigners lost heart and came trembling out of their fortresses. The Lord lives, and blessed be my rock, and exalted be my, ro- my God, the rock of my salvation. This is exactly what happened, if you recall, after he was anointed king. At first, you had the civil war, seven years. And then that's what I think he's alluding to here, is that people that you know, he didn't know, that he wasn't, they didn't really support him and have a relationship with him. That's what you talk about when you say, I know a person, you know, not just, well, yeah, I know Ron's name, but when you know somebody, it means you have a relationship that you understand them. He said, There's a, there were 10 of those tribes that I did not know. They were not with me, but he united them, didn't he? And they came together, and it was God he gives glory to as giving him that honor and being head of them. And, and then we see that there were kings that came out from their strongholds, from their fighting him, and said, okay, you the man, David. We're not fighting you. We're submitting. We know that God, your God, is on your side. And so this is a part of that glorifying God with that. And then the end of the song. The song. The God who gave me vengeance and brought down peoples under me, who brought me out, of my, out from my enemies, You exalted me above those who rose against me. You delivered me from men of violence. For this, I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations, and sing praises to your name. Great salvation he brings to his king, and shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his offspring forever. So do we lose the internet? Yes. I can't find us on YouTube. That's still recording, so... Yeah, that's why I didn't interrupt you, because... Yeah, we'll upload it. You can at least go back and post it. So that's what's going on, in case you're watching this after we upload it after, later on. We kind of got broke off. I guess we've got some bad... With the weather, I probably... So, it just continues to wrap up and roll up this idea of, of God gave him vengeance. You know, God's the one that provided that revenge wasn't himself. Mm-hmm. You know, he didn't take vengeance. It wasn't David. It was God. And, but he gave it to him. And there's that sense of, God gave me that. God provided that for me. <clears throat> I got my revenge. In other words, God did the, God's the one that did it. <clears throat> now, what's great, 51, I think is interesting, because great salvation he brings to his king and shows steadfast love to his anointed. We know that was with with Saul, as long as God could put up with him. But look at the last part. His offspring forever. There's the messianic prophecy. There's the promise of the Messiah coming through him. This blessing for the seed that even what Abraham had talked about. Well... That's all we got. I guess we're wrapping it up a little quicker. Well, not really. It's 8 o'clock. It kind of went good, but we'll get it uploaded for people who if we didn't get to finish this up. We were started out great. We had some good conversations, had a lot of engagement on the chat. So sorry about that, but let's go ahead and wrap up the recording, and we'll get it uploaded for everybody.